I survived 100 days as an engineer in hardcore Minecraft. Create Astral is a mod pack that turns Minecraft into an engineering masterpiece. You can create an infinite variety of automatic farms, machinery, custom tools, and you can explore space. In these 100 days, it's my mission to make it to the moon and save humanity. And all I'm gonna say is that the moon has a lot more to it than meets the eye. Along the way, I'll slowly upgrade my machinery and get better and better at automating resources. So, without further ado, everyone, relax, grab your favorite snacks, and enjoy. So, with day one, my journey to becoming a successful engineer began. I spawned in a village, which I wasn't expecting at all, but honestly, I'm glad this happened because it made me feel like I was a part of a civilization trying to get everybody to the moon. In Create Astral, you spawn in with a quest book, and this thing is very important. It guides you through all of the content in this pack, and Trust me, there is so much to do. My first quest was an introduction to the Hafastus mod, also known as Tinker's Construct, which is a lot easier to say. This mod lets you create tool parts and combine them into custom tools and then upgrade them in various different ways that you want to. I had to make a different variation of the crafting table, which would come in handy later, and this required me to make a pattern, which is easily made just with planks and sticks. With that in mind, I chopped down the acacia trees that were nearby and I created the pattern and combine them with a log to craft the crafting station. This is basically just a normal crafting table, but it can be combined with other important appliances later on. I was rewarded for my little progress with a bed, torches, and a book called Materials in You, which would serve as a guidebook for machinery, tools, and gear in the near future. I then tried to make a wooden pickaxe and realized that you literally cannot make wooden tools in this pack, meaning that I would have to use Tinker's Construct to progress at all. I made something called a Tinker Station in part builder which would be needed to create my tool parts and tools and I then realized that I didn't have to be building in the middle of nowhere and headed into the village beside me to uh, borrow <laughs> some loot and shelter as well you guys got any chests for me hello oh yes thank you very much hello another chest oh yeah Tomato seeds, red grape bush. After looting, I decided that I would set up in this house since it seemed to be the largest one and it had two floors. I placed down my station and checked out the part builder, which is the first thing I would have to use in order to create wooden tools. I wanted to make a pickaxe, which meant I needed a tool handle, binding, and pick head, all of which I made by placing empty patterns and wood into the part builder and then selecting the parts I wanted. Then I just had to combine these parts into a pickaxe using the tinker station and I now had an acacia wood pickaxe. <laughs> As a reward, I got a fruit salad, which was funny, and I also got a couple more guidebooks. I read into some of the upcoming quests we had, which were pretty simple, like collecting eight copper, tin, and iron, and making a furnace, and I then made a sword and a mattock, which is a tool that combines an axe and shovel into one, so it's really nice. With that, the first night approached, and I slept it off. I woke up to the next day with three villagers standing up above me and my bed. Yeah, uh, I needed to move out ASAP. Now that I was mostly set up, the best thing I could do was definitely to collect resources so that I could gear up and start creating machinery soon. So I headed out in search of a cave and while exploring, I ran into a zebra. I also found these interesting shambles of a house and there ended up being a chest here, which was nice. And I also robbed this car thing of its cogwheels because I knew that they would definitely come handy in the future. I also found this well, which I was oddly intrigued by and decided to dig down into it. It was kind of risky, but it ended up just being safe at the bottom with some ores and stone. I also found these massive rails, which turn out to be train rails. I would love to build a train in this pack in the future, but we still have a long ways to go before we can get to making things as large as that. I found another house, which I ran into. It had a nice little desk, storage, and fireplace. And I also found a way down, which led me into to the basement that had some random storage in it, which I happily looted for myself. I got some flares and a copper pickaxe. There was also a bedroom here in which I found a leather tunic and purple bed. I ended up finding a lot more things than I thought I would, so I had to drop my things back at home, and I created some stone tool parts so that I could upgrade all of my tools. By day three, I wanted to finally head out for a full mining trip, but I was running really low on food, so I decided I would hunt some fish, which I felt bad doing, but 
I, I needed to sustain myself for the time being. I then wanted to make a furnace to smelt up everything I had gotten, but when I tried doing that, it turns out that you need ore to make a furnace in this pack. So with that, I decided the only thing I could do is go mining. Along the way, I daydreamed a bit about the advanced food you can make in this pack because you can make some foods that will nourish your hunger for a long, long time. And soon enough, I found some tin ore on the surface. This stuff comes in handy for machinery later on and really all the ores that you find in this pack have a lot of use. Like even copper has a lot more uses in Create Mod, which I really like. After getting some ores, I returned home and crafted the furnace that I wanted with which I started cooking my food. I then wanted to place some chests down for storage when I realized just how many beds were in this house. It, that definitely explained why so many villagers had been coming over here. So I broke the beds and placed them in another house and um, that didn't work because you know what? A villager came right away and I slept next to him throughout the night and when I woke up, there were more villagers, but you know what? That's okay. I had a plan to build a factory close to the village in the future, large enough to hold a ton of machinery and to house me. And you know what? That factory ends up looking pretty cool. After that little break, I got back to mining. As I was looking for a cave though, I ran into a pack of lions, which I, I don't know. I didn't know they were in this pack, but uh, the funny thing is they're not aggressive, which is nothing like in real life. Like you do not want to be in a 1000 foot range of any lions, but here I, I was friends with them. I found a cave soon enough and was instantly attacked by a skeleton carrying a pistol and it did a lot of damage which made me realize just how vulnerable I was without a shield. I defeated it and started smelting my ores right away with which I made a shield and I then felt safer to continue mining. The only thing is you cannot make iron gear unless you press the iron ingots with uh, some special machinery which is something I could do later on but for the time being I found out that copper gear was a good substitute. While my copper smelted, I ran into two more skeletons, and these guys were not playing around, okay? Their pistols were doing some crazy damage, so I had to get away from them. My pickaxe also started getting low on durability, but what was nice is that I could use the tool station to repair it as long as I had cobblestone. I crafted a full set of copper armor, and with a combination of that and my shield, I had confidence in approaching the skeletons in the cave. I found some zinc ore here, which I had to mine using my copper pickaxe, and I continued just mining up all the ores I found. Soon though, I realized that I would need to get andesite and clay as a part of the next quest, which doesn't really make any sense yet, but as you'll see soon, these are really important resources that come in handy for a lot of machinery later on. On that note, I wasn't really finding any andesite in this cave, so I decided to head out. I was quite easily able to find the clay that I needed, which completed a part of the quest, but I still needed to find some andesite. I then ended up spawning a house in the distance, and this place uh, was pretty interesting. What is going on? It's a nice little humble abode. Cherry, red grape seeds, white grape seeds. Interesting. Got zebras out here. Don't worry, guys. I'm not gonna do nothing to you. Wine bottle. Interesting. Whoa, light gray kitchen floor. Look at that. Apple pie. Mmm, <gasps> I love me some apple pie. What can I throw out? Coarse dirt. There we go. Whoa, that's actually pretty good. Kitchen sink. Can I turn it on? No, I can't. Aging barrel? Whoa. Well, this is very cool, I've got to say. I'm glad that I found that. I continued on with my search for andesite, and nighttime then came. I didn't have a bed, which made my situation pretty dangerous, so I sprinted back for home and slept off the night as soon as I could. On the morning of day six, I headed out once more to try and find some andesite. I found an interesting village along the way with houses that were propped up on poles, and then found some andesite outside of another house, which was enough for me to complete my quest. With that collected, I headed back for home and saw some melons along the way, which I happily scooped on up and got back home just as the sun went down. On the start of the next day, I built a little furnace setup to smelt my ores, which I was easily able to do because I had collected a lot of coal. And with tin and iron smelted, I finally completed my quest and unlocked chapter one of this mod pack. I read the summary of this chapter and it explained that this chapter would introduce us to the basics of the mod pack, so that was exciting. Additionally, it said that future chapters would get more and more complicated and challenging with better rewards as well. Reading into this chapter, I found out you can make different types of stone generators in this pack, so you could generate things like andesite and granite, which would definitely come in handy. Now, before making machinery, we had to make basic materials.
materials. Using a smithing table, I combined tin and copper and made bronze, and then I combined andesite, iron nuggets, and clay to make andesite compound. I then used a stone cutter to cut my bronze ingots into bronze sheets and smelted up the andesite compound to make andesite alloy. As a reward for all of this material management, I got a dagger, which actually seemed to be pretty decent, and uh, I also may or may not have accidentally hit a villager with it. But it turns out you can't even trade with villagers in this mod pack, which I'm not sure why that is. I'm guessing just to keep uh, progression at a proper pace, since I know you can do some pretty crazy things with villagers. But anyways, maybe me hitting the villager would keep them away from my house, which I would love. Now that I had made all those materials, I could finally actually start working on machinery. I needed to make cogwheels and shafts, which are used to transfer power to the machinery that you use. And by holding W on different create mod items, you can actually learn a lot about them because it gives you a full diagram and examples on how you can use them, which is really, really useful, and I use it throughout this whole 100 days. Making cogwheels and shafts was pretty easy. I had to use the materials we had just made. I got some nice rewards and then progressed to my next step, which was making an andesite casing. These are used to make a lot of basic machinery. To make this, I placed a log down, stripped it with an axe, and right-clicked it with an andesite alloy. And boom, I made andesite casing. Now I could make my first piece of machinery called the mechanical press, which would let me press metals like iron, into sheets that I could then use to gear up and progress further in machinery. Creating this required a shaft, andesite casing, and block of iron, which was simple enough, but I didn't have enough iron to make it, so I had to go out mining again. By the next day, I found what looked to be a massive cave. I marked it down on my map, which would make it easier to find later, and headed in. Off the bat, there were a lot of mobs here, which I didn't love, but I did my best in slowly clearing them out. I got to mining and found iron right away, which was great, and even found diamonds, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, the only way to get your first diamond in this mod pack is with a mechanical drill since you can't mine diamonds with an iron pickaxe. I was finding a lot of diamond veins down here, so it sucked that I wasn't able to pick them up yet, but it was also good because I marked them down and would return soon. By the morning of day 10, I headed out of the cave and started smelting the ores I had gotten. I now had enough iron to craft a mechanical press. I also made a depot, which gives you a place to put your metals you use the press on. I placed everything upstairs and crafted a hand crank, which would allow me to power the machine manually for the time being. With that, I placed my iron ingots on the depot, spun the hand crank, and made iron sheets. It took a bit of time because only one iron sheet is made at a time, but soon enough I completed the quest of getting 10 of them. My reward was some smoke dam and an andesite casing. Now an array of possibilities opened up to me, as I could make five new machines. The mechanical mixer was the most important of the bunch for the time being, because this would let me progress further in the chapter. Soon enough we would be able to upgrade our armor and tools, and start setting up automatic machinery. I crafted the mechanical mixer and a basin, both of which had fairly simple recipes, and placed it outside where I decided I would put my machinery for now. I then found out that I would not be able to power this with a hand crank, meaning that I needed to start setting up an automatic energy source. Now, the first energy source that you can make is a water wheel, which is created by combining wood slabs with a large cog wheel. Easy enough. In order for it to actually work though, I had to place it down and then fully surround it with moving water. It also matters what direction direction you place the flow of water in, since the water wheel fans have a certain angle on them. With that, I covered it up, and now I needed to transfer the energy from the water wheel with shafts and cogwheels. I tried placing a couple shafts in a cogwheel, but that did not work. The machine wasn't rotating with enough speed, so I decided I would try to add a large cogwheel, but that didn't work either. I tried an array of other setups, none of which worked either. Finally, I changed the flow of water of the water wheel because it was flowing in the wrong direction. Exactly what I had talked about. I now wanted to create grout, which is a material that is used to create the meltery, which is really, really useful for creating upgraded tools. To do that, I would have to mix together andesite alloy, zinc, and gravel in a mechanical mixer. I needed more andesite alloy to do that, so I headed back to the large cave I had found earlier and mined up a good amount of andesite there. With that, I was able to make a decent amount of andesite compound, and while that smelted, I went out to collect gravel as well. With everything collected and smelted, I took took my andesite and zinc and placed it into the mixer alongside the gravel. The mixer started combining all the materials and after waiting for a little bit of time, I got a stack of grout. I got another batch going and while I waited for that, I crafted a book called Puny Smelting, which serves as a guidebook to figuring out the basics of the mod. It showed me a picture of how to make the meltery, which is what would allow us to progress to iron tinkers tools. I took some time to read through the book and then took a look at the rewards I got for getting grout, which there were a lot of. 
cog wheels and a set casings, gearboxes, and more. With that, we had unlocked the second chapter named Getting Industrial. Fluid storage, rose gold chest, astral. Oh. Visit Dimension the Moon. So by the end of this chapter, we will have visited the moon. I don't know if we can get that far, but I'm gonna try my best. Getting to the moon is a long journey indeed, but that was my main mission for these 100 days, and I would do everything needed to get there. The summary for this chapter described how gathering and managing resources would start to become a lot more difficult. Getting started with this chapter, the first thing we had to do was get seared bricks. These are what we needed to create the meltery. You make them by smelting grout, but instead of using a furnace, I wanted to use an encased fan because using one of these lets you smelt a stack of items with rapid speed and no coal. Since our collection of machinery was starting to grow, I decided I would create a temporary platform for them made out of stone bricks. I dug out a 10 by 10 area, then quickly filled it up, and now our machinery looks a lot neater. I needed more andesite in order to craft the propeller part for the fan, so I headed over to the cave with andesite once more and spent quite a bit of time mining until I had more than a few stacks of andesite. By day 16, I was able to craft the propeller and encased fan. I placed the fan down, which was great, but now I needed to do two things. Firstly, I needed to get it powered, and second of all, I had to put lava in front of it so that it would smelt things instead of just blowing out air. I was about to head out to collect the lava I needed when this happened. <gasps> it's a cat! Hello! Hello, buddy! Oh, I need fish. Do I have fish for you? Hold on. Raw salmon. Hey! Hey, where'd you go, buddy? Oh, there it is. Hey! Yeah, come here, buddy. Yellow and a blue eye. Oh, there we go. What are we gonna call you, buddy? Aw, let's call you Yo-Yo. How about that? I decided I would name her cat Yo-Yo because of the yellow and blue eyes. I brought Yo-Yo inside and now she could sit safely in our home. I was then gonna go caving for lava, but it turned out there was a lava pool right next to my base. So I scooped that up and built around the fan with blocks and placed a sign so that I could safely place the lava. I needed to power the fan next, which did not go so smoothly. I thought that I could power the fan in the same way as the mixer, but that was just not the case. I needed the cog wheel to be horizontal. I tried placing another water wheel and powering it with a gearbox, but at the time I didn't know yet how to properly rotate gearboxes with wrenches. So, for the time being, I decided I would just use a hand crank to power it. I threw down some grout in front of the fan, spun the hand crank, and sure enough, it worked. It took less than a minute, and I seared two stacks of seared bricks just like that. Now I needed to figure out how to put these bricks to use. I started by crafting a casting table, which is where I would put my casting molds. Next, I needed to make a seared melter, the main component of what we were making. It was quite reasonable source consuming. I needed to make seared brick blocks, but to do that I would have to mix the seared bricks together with sap. I could find sap on rubber trees. I also needed a fluid tank which required copper sheets and a barrel to make, so that was a lot easier to handle. I had to place another water wheel to power the mechanical press. I brought the energy up to the gearbox, which then allowed me to combine the shafts horizontally, and after wrenching it, the mixer was finally powered. I placed my copper ingots on the depot, and it worked. It was slower than a hand crank, but I was fine with that since it would automate my sheet metal production. I was happy with the progress I had made in machinery, so on the next morning I took some time to set up a potato farm. Now in the future, I make a pretty cool automatic version of this, but for the time being, a manual farm would work just fine. I fortunately had a good amount of bone meal, which let me increase my potato production by a lot, and was now well satiated to go out mining for ores needed to progress further in my engineering efforts. I quickly found zinc and made sure to get a lot of this stuff on this trip, which I had not done before. Before. By the end of the night, I went back home and quickly smelted up my ores with the encased fan. As a final step, I needed to head out to collect some sap from rubber trees. I found multiple out in a forest and made a tree tap so that I could harvest the sap off them. I broke the trees to collect some saplings as well, and with that, returned to mix up the sap and bricks together. I made a big mistake though, because I threw the sap into the mixer before the seared bricks. This caused the sap to be mixed into rubber and the seared bricks to have no effect. Now, rubber does have have use later on, but it was not what I needed at this time. So on day 21, I went out again and collected sap. This time when I returned to the mixer, I made sure to throw in the seared bricks and then the sap afterwards. That worked wonderfully and I now had the seared blocks needed to craft the melter. That completed my quest and I had some nice rewards awaiting me, but I didn't want to claim them until I was finished making the meltery. I placed down the seared heater, then the melter, and then the casting table and basin on the sides with seared faucets to output the fluid into them. 
them. With that, the meltery was ready to use. I put a stack of coal in for fuel and melted down some iron to make molten iron. With the smeltery kicking in full force, I wanted to upgrade my existing tools and make some new advanced tools for which I would need a tinker's anvil. To make one of those, I'd need bronze blocks, which uh, were pretty easy to make fortunately, and more seared blocks. But I was out of sap to make those. What I found out is that if you put rubber logs into a millstone, it'll mill out any sap within the logs. Crafting it was simple, and I was more than used to setting up water wheels as well, so I powered it pretty quickly. With that, I threw some rubber logs into it, and after some time, it started outputting sap, which was awesome. It was a bit slow though, so following a diagram, I set up some cog wheels in a way that would make the millstone faster, and now I was successfully milling rubber logs into sap at a quick rate. I got the seared blocks I needed and crafted a tinker's anvil. This gave me a whole new array of tools I could make. This included the cleaver, sledgehammer, vein hammer, and more. All of these could harvest resources in bulk. The sledgehammer in specific could mine in a 3x3 area, and this would let me collect important blocks like andesite with ease. In order to make the tool parts for all of these upgraded tools that I wanted and the hammer, I would have to create gold casts. The first step to doing that was getting molten gold. Then I made the tool parts I wanted with wood and placed them on the casting table. From there, I poured gold over the parts, which burned them and formed a golden mold around them. Bam, we had tool part casts that could now be filled with any metal type. I created these gold casts for all of the parts I needed, and with that was able to place the cast down on the table, pour iron onto them, and watch as my iron tool parts were formed. After that, all I had to do was put the parts onto my existing tools, and was fully upgraded to iron. To finish off, I wanted to create the sledgehammer, which was really expensive in comparison to the other tools. But after spending a good amount of time and resources, I successfully crafted the iron sledgehammer. I headed over to a stone wall to test it out, and it wasn't too fast yet, but when we would get some upgrades on this thing, it would go way faster. And there are a bunch of different upgrades that you can add to your tools in this pack. Uh, you can make them more durable, faster, and you can make them have cool perks like magnetism or auto smelting. I decided that I wanted to put fortune on my pickaxe so I could more efficiently get ores, and that just required four lapis blocks and blue dye. I then wanted to upgrade it to fortune two, but it turns out that you need a diamond for the second tier and a diamond block for fortune three. So I figured I would go caving to search for diamonds. I couldn't make a mechanical drill yet though because I was out of iron so I would have to go mining for iron first and while I did get some it didn't go so smoothly. Ow. Ow. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get them to turn against each other. Boom. That's already one turn against each other. Boom. Look at them. Oh! Okay. I'm gonna have to re-log otherwise I might die. I'm scared. I'm very scared right now. Please don't make me do this again. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm okay. Oh my god. Okay, the Enderman unaggroed when I relogged. Oh my god. Yeah, that was terrifyingly close. I did my best to build out safely and soon reach the surface. I was out of food and it was nighttime, which made things very dangerous. I made a break for it to get home and I started getting shot at by skeletons, which was not what I wanted, so I used the water near me to get away. I soon made it back home and slept off the night. On the next day, I did a lot of important maintenance tasks. I cooked up some food, smelted my iron, and expanded the potato farm. I crafted the mechanical drill we needed and uh, also finally made iron armor, which I should have done a lot earlier, but copper was pretty similar in its armor value. I made myself a makeshift pistol, which would protect me from range, and uh, I found out that making copper bullets is pretty easy as long as you have gunpowder, so that was nice. On the morning of day 28, I finally went out to mine for diamonds. <laughs> oh wow, there's a zombie army awaiting me. Good time to use my pistol. Now unfortunately, I can only hit one enemy at a time. Ow. Wow, there are a lot of zombies. This is pretty crazy, actually. Okay, Creeper, I'm gonna need you to do me a favor here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Creeper. Good job, buddy. I was able to find the diamonds from before quickly enough and went at them with the drill, which turned out to be successful. With the diamond in hand, I placed a tool station down and put the diamond on my pickaxe. This upgraded its durability, mining speed, and now allowed me to mine diamonds with it, which was awesome since I wouldn't have to deal with using a drill anymore. I put a diamond on my other tools to upgrade them as well and continued caving. My shield ended up breaking, which made me more vulnerable to mobs, but I was still able to scoop up a couple more diamonds 
diamonds. I made sure to get redstone here as well because it can be used to upgrade the mining speed of your tools and I definitely wanted to do that with my hammer. I mined into the next day and found a little building here which I went into and found something called an extractinator which apparently is just for cosmetic purposes even though it looked a bit scary. There were also a few chests here and a brewing stand which uh, I didn't have any materials to use but it was a nice find since there is no nether in this pack and the moon essentially replaces it. I returned home and put the redstone we got on my hammer for haste and also upgraded my pickaxe to fortune 3 which I was able to do because of how many diamonds we had gotten on our caving trip. I then collected the quest rewards I had been getting which I hadn't collected in quite a while. I got cake, some other food, and engineering supplies like gearboxes and cogwheels. Now that I had powerful tools, decent armor, and good progression and engineering, I wanted to work towards building our home slash factory. I went out and mined for copper and deep slate, which were the two main blocks I wanted to use, and our upgraded tools came in very clutch. They were very reliable and very durable. I returned on the morning of day 33 to drop off my inventory once, but uh, got right back at it after that. I continued mining from days 33 to 38, and throughout that time, I found uh, another one of these underground buildings, which was made out of sandstone this time. It was covered in water, which made it hard to loot, but it had a bunch of copper bullets, an enchanted book with chains three, and a bookshelf. After that, I got ganged up on by a group of skeletons and other mobs, but I fought them off using my tinker's tools. On day 35, as I was looking for a fresh cave, I found this house, which had a wall of bookshelves in it. I was breaking these when I found out there was a secret door, which was really cool. There were blocks of coal on the other side, and also a loot barrel underneath, which had these winemaker boots, which if you have the full set of, lets you infinitely bone meal crops. <laughs> Pretty overpowered. I found an enchanting table in one of the underground buildings on day 38, which was a great find, and by the end of the day, was back home. I had collected about 18 stacks of deep slate and three and a half stacks of raw copper blocks. And the encased fan is crazy, because I was able to throw all of our copper blocks on the floor, and within less than two minutes, it turned almost like four stacks of raw copper blocks into smelted ones. With all the materials collected, I was ready to start working on our factory. I decided that I wanted to stay close to the village because I wanted to feel like I was a part of a society, and I thought that this was the perfect spot to build on. I started by clearing out the area of grass and shrubs. This would even out the area that I wanted to work on, and after that I got started by outlining the build with deep slate bricks and tiles. The size wasn't small, but at the same time it wasn't too big to where I wouldn't be able to finish the build within a manageable amount of time, even though this ends up taking me a pretty good amount of time. I filled the border in with a mix of cobbled deep slate, polished deep slate, and the stone brick and tile variants as well. I figured using different variants for the walls would add a little bit more texture to the factory. I also added copper pillars along the sides to give the build some more variety and an industrial feel, which I liked a lot. As a side note, in between building, I decided I would finally enchant my gear to protect myself. It unfortunately turned out that I couldn't enchant my tinker's gear, but I was at least able to enchant my iron armor and got some lucky rolls like protection, unbreaking, and depth strider. By day 43, I was done with the walls, and now it was time to move on to designing the roof, for which I wanted to use copper around the edges and spruce wood on the inner layer. I would need to chop down a lot of wood, so I decided I would create a broad axe which can take out trees in one hit, and as you'll see soon, this thing is amazing. I also added a diamond to it so it would be more powerful, and it now had 5200 durability with 13.5 attack damage if we wanted to use it as a weapon. I was ready to chop down whole forests out here, so I headed out in search of spruce trees. This ended up taking me a lot longer to find than I thought it would. I traveled through a jungle and then got sidetracked when I found a cave, which would give me the opportunity to get more copper, which I also needed for the build. So yeah, back to more copper mining, which it was exactly what you think it is, just, just mining for copper. Anyways, I actually got a lot of copper on this trip and came home with about two stacks of raw copper blocks. The really cool part about using the copper on our factory is throughout these 100 days, we'll get to watch all of the copper oxidize and turn teal. I crafted cut copper so I could create stairs with it and then got to building the edge of the roof. I also started the front overhang of the roof, which I would need a lot more copper for it turned out, but I like. So I continued searching for spruce and also caves 
at the same time. Eventually, I found a very narrow cave entrance, which didn't have any promise at all, but as I went further into it, I found some copper, which was a good sign, and when I went a bit further in, I found a huge cave with copper all around, so I got pretty lucky. And while mining on day 49, I found this. Whoa, what is that? Holy moly. Look at this. Ho, ho, ho. What did I just find? Oh, my goodness. Moon sand? Uh, some type of a crater. I need to mark this down for sure. This is something called a shimmer lake, and it is very important in the future. So just keep in mind that we found this, and we'll return to its purpose later on. After our long mining trip, I finally returned to building on day 50. I got the roof shape complete, and now I would just have to fill it in with wood. Now, I tried seeing if something like oak would work, but I don't think it had any good synergy with copper or deep slate. So I headed out in search of spruce once more. I found this building, which uh, was like a train control station and had a lever on the inside. I think it was purely there for decorative purposes, but it was a very interesting find. I had been traveling for quite a while, but uh, by day 53, I finally found a snowy taiga in which there were spruce trees. I was able to mow trees down with one hit at a time. Chopping trees was now really quick because of our ax. And I might've went a bit overboard with chopping down trees because by the end of day 53, I got more than eight stacks of spruce logs, uh, which would definitely last me for a long time. Now I had to start the journey back home, which was a very long one because it had taken me 7,000 blocks of travel to get to where I was at. I traveled for all of day 54 and finally made it back on the morning of day 55. I then got to filling in our roof, which given the design was pretty easy to do, and I was able to fully fill the roof in with spruce wood. The next thing I did is made something called a carpenter's workbench. This is basically just the replacement for woodcutters in this pack, but it also does give you a lot of new appearances to choose from. I took a look at all of the different kinds of planks I could use, all of which looked great, and decided I would use spruce panels, lattice spruce planks, and hewn spruce planks. I don't know what any of those names meant, but I liked them. I transformed my regular planks and got back to working. By day 57, I was finished, and honestly, it looked better than I thought it would. Next, it was time to start working on the floor of the factory, and I worked on this from day 58 through to day 60. I started by fully clearing out the layer of dirt on the inside, then I filled in an outline of spruce logs, which gave the floor a solid look, and I filled it in with these frame planks I made using the carpenter's workbench. I think it came out very nicely and has a good industrial feel to it. With that design, I needed a front door, and I decided to make an iron sliding door, which uh, ended up being really cool. It's this 3x3 three three door and filled the space up a lot more than a regular door would. However, it still felt like the entrance was oddly small, so I worked on adding a bit of a design going on around it to fill in the space some more. I ended up creating this copper frame and then filled it in with spruce logs facing horizontally. Now, I knew that I should be done with the build here, but I couldn't help myself. I really wanted to add a little bit more detail. I essentially wanted to add spruce logs going across each each other right where the ceiling turned to spruce wood to act as support beams. I luckily had a good amount of bone meal to grow more trees, and with a hefty amount of wood, I decided I would make planked spruce logs. These things looked really fortified, which I liked, and I added three three wide rows of them going across the factory with five singular beams going across in the other direction. With that, we were done with the factory build. Before getting back to engineering, I wanted to make sure I had a storage area and all of my important utilities placed inside the factory, so I came to the idea of building an additional ledge within the factory. I used the same floor design and covered about half of the room with it without intruding too much on the first layer. I added some support beams to it, and with the ledge done, I added a storage for which I transferred everything over to from my old base. I then added an enchanting table and the other important stuff like a smithing table and furnaces. I tore down all of the machines we had set before. I know it was a sad sight, but it was worth it because it was now time to move everything into our factory. I also made sure to bring Yo-Yo with us. I started placing our machinery down and it was quite overwhelming having everything in my inventory at once. But I got to work once again, placing everything down and powering it. To try and understand how energy works and how it gets transferred between cogwheels and machinery, I decided I would make a pair of engineer's goggles, which show you what the speed of each machine and cogwheel is. I needed gold for it, which I didn't have, so I placed the meltery down and smelted some gold armor, which actually 
actually gave me a lot of gold ingots. With that, I crafted myself a pair of engineer's goggles. It turned out that there was an additional helmet slot where I could equip them, and I was looking good. Now I could tell what the kinetic stress of machinery was, which would essentially tell me how fast it was going. I transferred the energy to the mechanical press, and I got the millstone working as well. I then placed down the encased fan, which I surrounded with glass to make a little bit less dangerous. I was able to get it powered, but it was pulling things in rather than pushing them out, which meant that any items I dropped would get burned by it. By playing around with gearboxes and cogwheels, I was able to get it to blow outwards, and uh, I could definitely confirm that this was the case because it started burning me. Our automatic encased fan was now working, and I could quickly smelt items up without having to use the hand crank and drain my hunger bar. Now that all of that was set up, I could finally progress further in the quest tray. I had to make something called the deployer, which as you'll see, is a very important piece of machinery. I made a brass hand, which required andesoid alloy and rubber, and then took a look at what the machine is used for. Oh, <laughs> Look at that. That's hilarious. Look at that. It simulates a player's interactions by moving it like this. Okay, it looks like you can do a bunch of things, including attack mobs. This thing can do a bunch of other things like placing or harvesting blocks as well. It also processes items, which as you'll see is essential to our progression in this pack. To make it though, I needed a material called polished rose quartz, which requires regular rose quartz, which requires plain quartz. I was a bit lost because there was no nether in this pack and I had no idea how I would get the quartz needed, but it turned out that I could get some from milling down diorite. So I headed out in search of a fresh cave. I traveled in the direction of the ocean since I hadn't explored much of that direction at all, and I found an oil spill along the way, which I didn't expect at all, but I'm sure this will come in use in the future. I also found a troop of ships out at sea, which I approached, and it ended up being a ship village. I then may have went around looting all the barrels and chests here, one of which gave me this eternal knife and another a double axe, both of which were unique weapons. I also found some sponges and a little caged area with gold and chests full of ore on the inside, which I more than happily looted. Now I'm very glad that the villagers in this mod pack don't have a reputation system because if they did, they would hate me. I found a little shipwreck area to the side as well, which I looted iron from and I continued onwards. I ended up finding a huge pillager ship in the distance, but I knew for a fact that I was not ready to approach something like this, so I moved on. Eventually I reached the land and was met by a pleasant plane biome, which was a good sign. Caves are usually easier to find in biomes like this. Sure enough, I very shortly found a cave opening. I tested out the eternal knife on some mobs here, and it was okay. It wasn't really any better than my iron sword because it had a slow attack speed. Anyways, I mined for a while and got iron, diamonds, and diorite. After that, I took a long journey through the gloomy ocean to get back home and return by midnight. I threw my diorite into the millstone and looked into how I would polish rose quartz, which would just require the use of sand paper. I got a piece of quartz from the millstone, which I used to craft rose quartz, and then crafted sandpaper, which was just sand and paper combined. I put the sandpaper in my offhand and right-clicked it while holding the rose quartz, and bam, I finally had polished rose quartz. With all of the materials collected, I was able to make the deployer. The next thing I had to do was make a piece of copper casing, because this would be needed for the next tier of machinery, and this is where things started to get a bit more complex. I needed to run a piece of andesite casing through a sequence involving two deployers, one of which would carry rubber and one copper sheets for a total of three times. In order to get something like this working, I would need to use a mechanical belt. All I needed to make them was dried kelp and rubber, so I headed into the ocean, gathered a large amount of fresh kelp, and made a mechanical belt. Now, I could have just used two deployers for this quest, but I decided that I would work on a six deployer setup for it to make it work faster. I set up a rubber farm outside of my factory for more resources, and it was only a at this point, when I was trying to mix some sap up, that I realized our mechanical mixer was not powered at all. This led me to trying to fix the issue for a while, and in the end, I just set up two water wheels and finally had everything powered on day 71. After that, I got to working on the line of deployers needed to create copper casing, and I've got to tell you, gearboxes and a wrench come very in handy. I got two deployers working and then started testing out how I would have to process the andesite casing using them. I needed to set up the rest of the deployers and I would be good to go. So I went out to collect sap and rubber logs and then process these items using my machinery. With that, I was able to make the four deployers I needed, set them all up in a line, and then using two shafts on both sides, I was able to create a conveyor belt spanning eight blocks. And then something bad happened. <laughs> my uh, my computer crashed and our progress from the last day or 
so got reset, but we were still on the same day in game. It's okay though, because I worked hard to get everything back and soon enough remade all four deployers. Now I needed to power everything up. I plan on doing so by extending gearboxes through the line, but that didn't work as it said the contraption was getting overstressed. I worked on building another water wheel, but before I could do that, I ran out of gearboxes. And by the way, to make gearboxes, you just have to combine bronze sheets and andesite alloy to craft cogwheels. And then you have to combine four cogwheels around an andesite casing to make your gearboxes. However, when I placed one of these and connected the second water wheel to the deployers, the machinery was still overstressed. What I ended up having to do was remove the middle gearbox and deployer and shift them over to the end of the conveyor belt so that that way there were three gearboxes on each side of the belt with a space in between. The deployers were now working perfectly and I just needed to get the conveyor belt powered. I ran out of machine parts again while doing so and didn't have any ores so it was time for me to go mining again. I got right to it and did not waste time collecting things I didn't need. So by the morning of day 74, I returned home already. When I did, I saw the first copper block to have turned teal on our factory, which was really nice to see. I smelted up the ores we got and as I was picking them up from the encased fan area, it started burning me down and I could not jump because of how much it was burning me. I literally almost died, but was able to barely get out because I had a water bucket. With that experience, I most definitely realized that I needed to replace a block here with a slab so that I could not get trapped to death like that again. Anyways, with the resources we got, I was able to create the gearboxes needed and powered the conveyor belt successfully. I equipped the deployers in the order of rubber, then copper sheets three times, and with them full, I just had to throw in the andesite casings. I was very happy to have finally cracked the code to making copper casings. Oh my god, it's happening. Okay, a little pause here, a little pause. Boom, hit it with the copper, with the rubber again, and with the copper again. Oh my god, we did it. Yes. Woo, we did it, we did it, we did it. Finally! I continued the process of throwing down andesite casings and letting them pass through the line, and with that, made five copper casings. With that done, I had to complete the quest of creating fluid pipes. These are important for inputting and outputting liquids. Apparently, they can break and spill if you mix liquids in them though, so we would have to watch out for that. Making the pipes was no problem, and I also combined a fluid pump with a cogwheel to make something called a mechanical pump, which is really important. Progressing further, I made something called a spout which simply required copper casing and dried kelp to make. Spouts are used to fill items with liquids and was required for our next quest, which was to make an electron tube. These are made by pouring molten rose gold onto polished rose quartz. Reading into rose gold, it's a liquid that required molten copper and molten gold to be created, so we would need to use the meltery to melt metals down. I started by extending fluid pipes out of the meltery and connected them to the spout. Looking at diagrams, I found that I would need to use a mechanical pump in order to transfer the liquids out, so I connected one of them to the spout and it seemed to be correctly placed. In order to power it, I built another water wheel and connected cogwheels to the spout. The liquid didn't seem to be pumping yet though, so I placed another mechanical pump connecting to the meltery and powered it as well. Sure enough, the gold then started flowing into the spout. This did not end up working, and that's because in order to mix materials, you have to use a basin. Yeah, that would uh, add a lot of machine work to our agenda, but we had to do it. At first, I thought that I would just be able to pour the liquid liquid metals into a basin and they would mix on their own. So I set up the piping in a way that would allow me to transfer liquids in and out of it. I was able to get molten gold inside of it, but when I added molten copper to it, it did not mix. The two liquids sat there separately. Oh, because do we need a mixer? No. <laughs> oh my God. Why are you making my life hard? Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. I need to make another mixer. Enderman, I don't like the fact that you're here, man, but I'm scared to fight you. So no, you know what? I'm not scared. You're dying. Totally not scared of you. Get away, get away, get away. Oh, okay, we're good. I thought I would need a smart fluid pipe to take the mixed liquid out, so I also started working on making that. And this thing is complex to craft. And I also made the mechanical mixer. I placed it down, and now I had to power it. I tried using the energy current I already had, but <laughs> as we know how it always goes, it, it did not work out. After making another water wheel, though, it worked as we needed. Oh, it's mixing it, it's mixing it. Oh, molten rose gold. Woo. Okay. 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 Guys, we made it. We made it. Wait, now we just need the molten rose gold to be taken out of there. And we have a smart valve. And now, boom. 
We hit it with a pipe. Sure enough, the liquid flowed into the spout. And with that, all I needed to do was place a polished rose quartz down and we made the electron tube. We actually did it. I, I'm, 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 I'm seriously, I'm so impressed that I made this. Yo, yo, can you believe this? I need to give Yo-Yo a treat in celebration. Hold on. Here you go, Yo-Yo. I celebrated for a bit more with Yo-Yo, and now it was time to progress further. I needed to make a variety of new machinery, an item drain, which combines a copper casing with an iron bar, a hose pulley, which requires copper casing, a dried kelp block, and copper sheets, and this is actually a really useful piece of machinery, as you'll see later on. And finally, a portable fluid interface. I also had to pour iron onto a compass to make something called an explorer's compass. This thing is pretty overpowered. It literally really shows you where any structure in the world is. We were starting to get really close to make it to the moon. Getting sidetracked a little bit, I wanted to unlock chapter 2.5, which just required us to complete a simple quest. I had to make andesite funnels used for inputting and outputting items out of chests, and with that, we were able to unlock chapter 2.5, which explained that automating resources would be really important for longevity in this pack, so that's something we would need to remember and do later on. However, right now, I wanted to stay focused on getting to the moon. Our next quest was to make a redstone chip, and this is one of, if not the biggest challenge in this pack. In order to make it, you have to take an electron tube through the sequence. First of all, you pour molten copper on it. Second of all, you deploy a wire onto it. And third, you use a mechanical press on it. Yeah, we had to make that happen 12 times in a row for it to create a redstone chip. I figured the best place to set this up would be next to our existing spout, since that way we could skip redoing the whole meltery setup. I placed a mechanical mixer and deployer next to it and hooked them up to power. I then wanted to set up a conveyor belt that would loop the materials through the machinery since there was no way I was manually going to place all the items down. It was nice to have gears on the ground because they ended up automatically powering the first belt and now I needed to figure out how to finish looping it. I came to this design where theoretically items would be able to loop through smoothly and I could create the redstone chip in no time. I needed to power the rest of the conveyor belt so I built another water reel and brought its energy up with shafts and a gearbox. But the bad news is that I realized the machines were in the wrong order. The spout was supposed to come first, so I removed the machines and I reconnected the spout in a different way. I then added the deployer and mechanical press to the other side of it and combined a few cogwheels together in a way that would power everything. I also added another gearbox to the side and now the full loop was working. All that was left was getting the required materials. Molten copper was fairly easy to make at this point, but for step two, I needed a wire, which I had never made before. At first, I thought I might need to use the meltery and a wire cast to make the wires one at a time, but it turned out that I would need to use something called a rolling mill and insert sheets of metal into it. Its recipe was simple enough, given everything we had made beforehand, so I was able to craft it, and I placed it right next to our other machines. I didn't make the same mistake I've made before and made a new water wheel right away. I then had to transfer the energy, which wasn't the easiest thing to do because I had to build the water wheel kind of far from the mill. I ran out of engineering gear, so I spent a while collecting more clay and andesite to make more, and returned to powering the rolling mill afterwards. The machine ended up receiving too much power though, sometimes it's too much, sometimes it's too little, and I wasn't sure how to fix this. I tried experimenting with the gears and testing what was making it have too much power. I ended up building three vertical water wheels, which actually worked, but uh, I think this is because the water wheels were working at a slower speed. So I could have just slowed down the original water wheel. But hey, the rolling mill was working and I was not going to complain. I threw in some copper sheets and it started working. Very shortly after, I was able to take out copper wires and I placed them into the deployer. With that, I smelted some copper and filled the spout with it. And I was now ready to place our electron tube down and watch our contraption get to work. Now we should just have to throw this on there. Boom, gets sprayed. Oh, it's getting copper wired and it gets pressed. Boom. So that should just have to repeat itself 12 times. <laughs> okay, that's gonna be a bit of a process, but let's see if the conveyor belt fully makes its loop around successfully. It does, and it's going. Okay, awesome. Now I hope that once it reaches 12, it just kind of stops working. While that's happening, I would like to kind of work on our food situation here. Now there are a lot of new types of foods introduced because of the Farmer's Delight mod. Another option though is just making a simple automated potato farm, for example. Oh, it's a skeleton horse, hold on. That's kind of cool. Oh! 
Why did I not think of this? Oh my god, they all have pistols. Holy moly, hold on. I'm gonna take them out. Bullets, bullets, and can I enchant the pistol? There we go, level 20 and breaking two, power two, punch one. That's not bad. Oh, I took out a skeleton horse. Got him. Can't believe I fell for this. And I accidentally took out two of the horses, but we have kept one alive. Ooh, okay, we did that. Now, it would be nice to have automatic food farms working for us so that we can make one of the kind of super foods that comes with the Farmer's Delight mod. And then there's stuff like the, these stews, which are have nourishment on them, meaning they, uh, they will definitely last you for a while, nutrition-wise. Let's see, is this done? Oh, it's done. Ooh, redstone chip. Our next task was to collect a liquid called shimmer, which is the liquid that was in that strange pond we had found underground earlier. So it was good that we already knew where to get it. Now, from what I understood, I was supposed to collect the shimmer liquid using something called a hose pulley, which works as shown. It plants itself down and then slowly takes in the liquid that's around it. You'll see more about this soon. Before that, however, I wanted to make an automatic potato farm because I was struggling with continually manually making food. The first step was making something called mechanical harvesters, which would do all of the harvesting of potatoes. I had to collect some more materials first and eventually made the andesite compound needed to craft five of these things. I also made two portable storage interfaces because these would be used to transfer items harvested to a chest and I can now start making the farm. I dug out an area to pour down water and I had to sow the ground in a kind of strange circular pattern since that's how the mechanical harvester would move. With the design done, I started working on the machinery to power this thing, which I probably should have done first. I created a water wheel for energy, then placed a mechanical bearing to transfer the power and a radial chassis above it to spin our contraption. This consisted of five blocks of any type, but I chose to use deep slate to match our factory. Then mechanical harvesters, and uh, these, uh, <laughs> these looked scary. I then added a chest, which would automatically have items and put it into it. And finally added a portable storage interface attached to it. And this would allow me to transfer the harvested potatoes. I had to add a slime ball to the chassis to make it stick to the harvesters and with that I was able to activate this thing and it definitely looked like it could damage me but luckily it didn't which is a very good thing. Now I just had to add water and re-sew the ground. While doing that I accidentally right clicked the chassis and uh, found out that you can pause it. The only issue being that it unsoils the dirt below it when you do. With it seemingly being ready to go I planted all of my potatoes and then uh, then then this happened. Okay. Oh, oh, hold on. That's not supposed to happen. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. Why did that happen? Yeah, I wasn't sure of any way to fix this other than removing all the potatoes, starting the machine, and then planting everything down again. I bone milled some potatoes to test it out, and sure enough, it broke and replanted them. But it wasn't connecting to the other portable storage interface to output the crops collected. It turned out that I just had to move the second portable interface one block back, and it was now connecting well. It was transferring the potatoes, but I spent a while trying to figure out how to take them out. The solution was placed a hopper underneath it and it was able to output the loot to a chest. The issue though is that when I had a hopper placed down, the machine would drop off the potatoes and then completely stop moving. I didn't have enough time to deal with this so I decided I would just leave it as it was for now and whenever I would need to collect my potatoes, I would just connect a hopper back into it and that would output all of the collected harvest. Okay, now that we were done with that, I wanted to get back to our mission of getting to the moon. Now I thought that this would require us to use a hose pulley and fluid tanks, which I crafted with copper and barrels in order to store the liquid and bring it home. This doesn't go exactly according to plan as you'll see, but that's what I was set on doing. So I grabbed all of the engineering gear that we would need, which required what I mentioned, uh, fluid pipes, a uh, water wheel, and a few more parts. I headed out for the shimmer lake we had found before and brought a saddle with me in case we found a horse. In fact, I found a zebra, which I was able to tame, and it wasn't that fast, but it would still help us in getting to our destination a little bit quicker. I ended up having to leave it behind because there was a large ocean of water on my path and I didn't have time to lose. Eventually, I made it to our desired location and started digging down. I reached the caving system that was here and after being lost for a bit, I finally made it to the lake. I headed to the center where I would set up the hose pulley. I connected piping to some fluid tanks and with that set up, I started working on the water wheel for energy, which did not go so smoothly. But I eventually figured it out and was able to get the gear spinning as as they should. With that, the fluid tank started to get filled up. Oh my goodness, it's actually working. No way. 
Oh, look at that. It's going around the edges. Oh my goodness. This is amazing. I can't believe it. And I've been getting some achievements for doing that. Here we go. Potion of healing. And we need an astral conduit for which we need shimmer, block of diamond, redstone chip, and flint and steel. Seems pretty easy. We also need to make shimmering stone, so we'll need more shimmer for that. And we need to make this gear, oh boy, which is kind of seemingly difficult to make. We mainly need these sturdy sheets, so we'll have to figure out how to make that. After looking through the upcoming quests, I waited for a while longer to let my fluid tanks fill up. But then my, uh, my work sphere came true okay and it is done now moment of truth no is it not full oh my god it did not keep its capacity it did not keep everything in it did it so that's my fault that's my fault does that mean this lost everything to okay yeah you can't pick up the fluid tanks with their liquid still stored inside which i don't know why i thought they would be able to as a backup strategy i figured i could just fill up a bunch of buckets with the shimmer liquid i needed to get iron to make buckets though so i set up a furnace and looked around the cave and searched for iron ore until i had enough buckets to fill up my inventory with shimmer and it's a good thing that i got as much as i did as you'll see soon things however went really south when when this happened. Oh, man, my shield broke. That's not what you want to happen. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Holy moly. Goodness. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that I survived though. That was almost it right there. A death and we would have lost all of our progress of getting to the moon. Fortunately though, that wasn't the case. And the next objective I wanted to complete was making an astral conduit. This was actually pretty simple compared to all the other things we had done in the past. I poured a bucket of shimmer into a basin, then added a diamond block, the redstone chip we made, and flint and steel. And it got straight to mixing, at the end of which we were left with an astral conduit. The reward was an enchanted golden apple, which was pretty nice, but that was uh, only one third of the things we needed to do to get to the moon. The next quest I wanted to complete is getting 10 moonstone, which would be used to create the portal to the moon. Yeah, I know it's not a rocket. Uh, I was kind of disappointed about that too, but at least there's a lot more cool machinery to explore and there might be rockets later on. The description read that we could find moonstone either at mine shafts, meteor crashes, or shimmer lakes. I used my explorer's compass to try and find a meteor, but unfortunately, there wasn't one within a 1,000 block radius. So I searched for a mine shaft, and there ended up being one really close by. I followed the compass until I was right above it and then mined my way down. Eventually, I mined right into it and did a very clutch water bucket. I started looking around the mine shaft in search of chests and found one after some searching, which had some torches, ores, as well as a rapier, which I tested out on mobs. And it was an interesting, quick weapon, but it wasn't something that I wanted to replace our sword with. I ended up being unsuccessful in finding any moonstone down here here unfortunately, so I returned to the surface and set my compass to find the nearest shimmer lake. It turned out that there was one 200 blocks from my base, so I mined straight down to it, this time with a too wide hole to make sure I was safe and found it fairly quickly. I ran around trying to find it, but was honestly very lost as to what it would look like when it spawned. I was so lost that I headed back home before doing some more research and realizing that the stone did in fact spawn around the shimmer lake as individual pieces, which made it make more sense as to why I couldn't find it before. I went around scooping the stuff up until I had 14 pieces, which would be more than enough. What I had to do next is pour shimmer into the meltery, place a moonstone in a casting basin, and pour the shimmer over it. With that done, I had to wait 50 seconds for it to fully form, and bam, we had a shimmering stone. We would need to do this a total of 10 times, so I decided I would just keep track of it as I continued progressing on my other quests. Which, speaking of, was to make an electrolyzer, which is a machine that can and convert water into oxygen, and this would be used to fill up our space gear with oxygen. In order to make the main piece of the electrolyzer, I needed another redstone chip, copper casings, and insulated copper cable. We already had a machine line set up from before, so getting another chip processing was fairly easy. I made a new electron tube and started the process of making more copper casings and also started processing the electron tube. Finally, I needed to make insulated copper cables, which required copper rods, made by throwing copper ingots into a rolling mill. With copper rods, I made copper cables and then insulated them with rubber. While waiting for the electron tube to be transformed into a redstone chip, I realized that we would need a lot more copper casing to build the electrolyzer, a total of 17 blocks to be exact. Processing them wasn't a problem anymore. Getting the materials was the hard part. I set my copper ingots to get pressed and collected sap and rubber logs from the rubber farm I had outside and looked into the other blocks I would need to make, which 
which were copper coil blocks. These were made with copper wires and spools, which are made by combining iron nuggets and iron sheets. I returned with my collected rubber and got to work on creating some of the copper coil blocks, which we were going to need to make a pretty good amount of. After that, our redstone chip was finally done, and I was able to craft up the electrolyzer. I spent the night of this day hunting skeletons because I needed bone meal to farm more rubber trees. I soon found my first prey and took it out with my powerful copper pistol. I ran into a gang of skeletons who started shooting each other, which made it a lot easier to take them all out. And by sunrise of day 94, I was up to a total of 20 bones, which got me just over a stack of bone meal. I was able to grow a lot of trees and cut them down, and I got more than two and a half stacks of rubber logs to mill down, which would provide me with all the rubber I needed. It turned out that I didn't have much copper though, so I had to go out mining once again. I got about six stacks, which I smelted, and was easily able to turn a couple stacks into sheets using my mechanical press. With that, I gave three of the deployer hands 11 rubber and three of them 11 copper sheets and let the machine create 11 copper casings. I realized though that I would need six more since I had used six to create the electro block itself and I set it up to do its thing. With that, I started building the electrolyzer. It required the main block to be placed with eight surrounding copper casings on the bottom layer, then eight copper coil in the middle with a space in the middle, and finally a layer of copper casing to finish it off. We had made the base for the electrolyzer, but now needed to input water into it and output oxygen. To output oxygen, I needed to craft something called an oxygen loader. This thing was quite costly, but mostly required resources we had used before. While working on this, I also collected the 10th piece of shimmering stone, meaning we could now make a portal to the moon. I didn't do that yet though, as we needed to create the gear required to survive on the moon, and I didn't want to rush things. I started gathering up my resources and crafted the many parts I needed until I ran into making an engine fan which I needed a sturdy sheet for which is made by milling up obsidian and then using that in a double mechanical press sequence. Getting enough of these sheets ends up being a pretty difficult thing to do. I once again headed out in search of a cave where I wanted to find obsidian which thinking back on this now I, sh I should have just placed water on the lava pool near my base but I didn't think of that at the time. Anyways I ended up running through a lush cave and used my map to dig towards lava which worked well. I spent a bunch of time mining obsidian, and once I got 25 pieces, I headed back home. I also quickly made a set of traveler's gear, which is a set of unique armor I should have made earlier because you can add a lot of upgrades to it and make it quite powerful. Anyways, I was going to replace all of the deployers with mechanical presses, but when I tried to do that, the engines got overstressed. To simplify things, I just placed the two presses at our conveyor belt loop and threw down all of the obsidian dust to start processing it automatically. The Sheets had to run through the press five times, so while I was waiting on that, I crafted some more of the parts we needed to make for space gear. When I returned to the sheets though, I was in dismay because a lot of our sheets had turned into gravel. I thought it was my fault, but it turns out that they have a 40% chance of turning into gravel, so I just got pretty unlucky with most of them. Anyways, we had to continue on, so I crafted an oxygen loader, started making some more of these sheets, and then started working on the input and output of water and oxygen to our electrolyzer. This machine would require me to pump in water from the bottom, which we could do using a mechanical pump, infinite water source, and water wheel. Using cogwheels, I then powered the oxygen loader and used a separate water wheel to power the mechanical pump. We were done. The electrolyzer was now taking in water and outputting oxygen. I picked up the rest of the sturdy sheets that we had made and started crafting the space gear we needed. I crafted a diving helmet using copper and glass, then added sturdy sheets to it to make it a space helmet made two oxygen tanks, which I used in combination with a copper back tank to craft a space suit, made diving boots with copper and andesite and upgraded them using sturdy sheets and wool. And now I just needed four more sturdy sheets to craft space leggings. I dug down right in the corner of the factory because we did not have time to waste. I collected a good amount of obsidian to make sure we wouldn't come out empty handed after all of it got processed. And with 14 obsidian collected by day 100, I headed straight back for home. I had one day Day left to get to the moon. I started milling the obsidian, built the moon portal while waiting for that, and activated it with an astral conduit. While this portal was a bit anticlimactic, I was still really excited to complete our mission and see what the moon would look like. I loaded my spacesuit up with oxygen, collected the powdered obsidian, and started getting it pressed right away. I had to wait for a while, and as soon as the sturdy sheets were made, I collected them and crafted the space pants. Put that on? Oh yeah!
Oh, yeah. Wait, let me take these engineer goggles off for now. We're looking good. We are looking good. Okay, with this, we should be able to head onto the moon. Oh, boy. <laughs> We've been working so hard towards this. I literally don't know what to expect, but we don't have time to play around. So let's see. Oh boy. Here we are. Oh, oh yeah. I'm feeling the gravity. Upon entering the moon, I found a chest right away, which had some moon sand, rubber, and glowstone dust inside of it. I explored further and ended up finding some structures around me. It was clear that I was not the only life form on this planet. I saw magma creams floating around and found some new blocks. I had to be very careful because I was on limited oxygen supply, but there was definitely a whole lot more to discover here than I thought there'd be. Now, soon after, I found a cave, and this is when things got very scary. There's glowstone. Oh, what is that? What is that? It's an alien. Oh my god. I don't know if I want to fight it. I don't think we're ready yet. Oh no. These aliens are spawning everywhere. Okay, we have to head back home. I'm not prepared. Oh, it's fast. Oh, it's shooting stuff at me. Okay. What is that? What is that? Ow! Ow! Ow, 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 ow. Get me out. Get me out. I'm not ready. I'm, I need to enchant this astronaut gear. Oh my god. Oh my god. I was not expecting these things to spawn. I, w I want to discover what's there, but oh no. Nope. 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 No! Ow. 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 Get me out. Get me out. Get me out. Get me out. Woo! <laughs> okay. Yo, yo, come here. Yo, yo, you're, we're sleeping. My purple bed is going right there. Oh, no, that's, that's not a very nice spot. Okay, our purple bed's going right there. Yo, yo, we're taking a sleepy. We had done it. We had survived 100 days of being an engineer and made it to the moon successfully, which honestly, I wasn't sure we'd be able to do. To end off the 100 days, I headed back onto the moon and there is definitely a whole lot more to explore in this mod pack. If you guys want a continuation of me surviving 100 days as an engineer on the moon and hopefully other planets, let me know in the comments and leave a like. Also, one of the aliens started attacking me and it was actually very powerful because of the gravity. Luckily though, I used the portal as cover, which let let me avoid many of its hits, and I took it out. Here's to another possible 100 days, everybody.